Hello everyone, it's Professor Rako here again, uh, continuing on with our earnings per share chapter. We're switching gears now, we're focusing in on dilutive uh, earnings per share. And so what we're going to do over the next couple of videos is uh, I'm going to walk you through our different types of uh, dilutive uh, securities and how we go about handling them when we calculate dilutive earnings per share. All right, so remember, we had a simple, comp uh, simple capital structure when there's no dilutive security. So here we have a complex uh, when dilutive securities are present. Uh, and we're going to compute diluting earnings per share, you, including the effect of all. And here's the important thing. I said this when we talked about basic. Potential dilutive common stock. All right, so remember, basic earnings per share is your actual earnings per share. It's based on what actually happened during the year. All right, dilutive earnings per share is a what if. Okay, so what if all the convertible bonds and preferred stock were converted and what if all the stock options and warrants and restricted stock and all that stuff was exercised or, or uh, being able to be used. Okay, so and we're going to what that does is it increases our denominator, which dilutes earnings per share. So remember, dilutive earnings per share is just hypothetical. So what we're going to do is walk through convertible bonds in this one and then convertible, convertible preferred stock. And then we'll do the uh, exercise, I'm sorry, the options and the warrants, and then we'll put everything together in one bigger problem. Okay, so with convertible securities, all right, we are in this mainly talking about bonds in this one. All right, we're going to measure the dilutive effect of potential conversion on earnings per share. Once again, notice here, potential conversion. Okay, and we just call this the if converted method because we're saying what if they were converted. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to assume that conversion took place at the beginning of the year or, okay, and this is important, when the security was issued. Meaning if it was issued during the year, we can't go back to the beginning of the year because it wasn't there at the beginning of the year. If it was issued during the year, we can only go back to that point in time. All right, so we'll look at an example with that as well. All right, and that's going to increase, and then uh, so if that conversion took place, then it's going to increase the number of shares outstanding because what we're saying is what if they were all converted at the beginning of the year? If they were all converted, they'd have been converted into common stock, which would increase our denominator. All right. And then dealing with bonds, uh, if we converted them all at the beginning of the year, remember bonds, go back to our long term liability chapter. Remember we dealt with bonds and remember bonds, we pay interest every six months. All right. And so there's interest expense that we're, uh, you know, that's accumulating during the year. Well, if we converted them at the beginning of the year, then there would not have been any bonds outstanding. Therefore, they, we would not have had that interest. So we need to add that interest back and we'll add it back net of tax. OK, uh, we'll see the preferred stock effect in the next video. All right. So adding back that interest net of tax affects our uh, our numerator, the income, the top part of their earnings per share. So let's just walk through uh, how we're doing that. All right. So when there are bonds, net income is adjusted. All right, so remember, I always talk about numerator and denominator effects. So this is my numerator, uh, and this is my uh, denominator. All right, sorry, that got cut off. All right, so net income is adjusted by adding back the interest net of tax to net income. All right, uh, so the way we go about doing this is we're going to take the total face value of the bonds times whatever percent the bonds are. Okay, now look, so if you're looking back, if you look back in our bond chapter when we went through bonds, this right here is the formula for the cash payment. Okay, now remember, the interest payment was always different than the interest expense because we had a discount or premium. All right, what I'm going to do in this chapter is I always just say, let's just assume the bonds were issued at par. If they're issued at par, this calculation right here is, yeah, it's still the cash payment, but it will also be the interest expense. All right. In reality, what you would have to do is do a full amortization table and take the total interest expense for that year and then add that number back net of tax. Now, look, we know how to do that. Uh, that's not the issue. It's just, you know, this chapter is dealing with the earnings per share, not bonds. So we I don't want to waste the time on tests for somebody to set up an entire amortization table just to get this interest number and add it back net of tax. That's not the point here. OK, but. Just make sure you see that in reality, you would have that amortization table. You would take the interest expense for the year from that table and then add it back net of tax. But we're going to just keep it easy in this chapter and make sure everything's just issued at face at par value, or I should say face value. At least. And then to add something back uh, net of tax, you just multiply it one minus the tax rate. All right. So we'll do that every time with bonds. And the denominator is pretty straightforward. It'll say each bond is converted into X number of shares. And we'll just do that math real quick. And that will be our denominator. All right. So let's do an example here. 
Uh, we've got a company, they have outstanding 500,000 8% bonds that were issued at par or face value. Each bond, each $1,000 bond is convertible into 80 shares of common stock. They had a, this sentence right here, 100,000 common stock outstanding during the year. That just tells me I do not have to calculate the denominator and basic earnings per share, meaning there's no share transactions. Net income was 83, tax rate is 30. All right, so basic, remember, is net income minus a preferred stock dividend. So in this problem, there's not one, divided by weighted average shares outstanding. Okay, so when we focus on dilutive here, we make the basic pretty easy. But remember, with basic, you're asking yourself, is there, a preferred stock, is there a preferred stock and do I need to subtract the dividend? That's your question one in this example, no. Uh, and were there actual share transactions so that I need to calculate weighted average shares outstanding, my denominator? The answer here is no. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. All right, so when I'm doing dilutive, I tip, I'll just say, all right, what's my numerator effect and what's my denominator effect? All right, so my numerator effect, I remember I'm, I'm using this stuff right here now that I'm going I'm to put it, use it with numbers down here at the bottom. All right, so we have 500,000 times 8% times 1 minus the tax rate, which is 30%. All right, so that equals 28,000. Now, look, these were outstanding all year. So in reality, the inch, this is for a full year's interest. So, I mean, you could technically say, all right, it's all it's all 12 twelfths of the year. OK, you don't have to write that, but I, I typically like to get to a habit of reminding students to pay attention to the dates. So it's not a bad habit to get into. All right. The denominator effect. All right. So it says each bond is converted to 80 shares. All right. Well, we need to figure out how many bonds there are. All right. So we have 500,000 total outstanding and each bond has a value of 1000. Okay, so that means there's 500 bonds. All right, so if we have 500 bonds and each is converted into 80 shares, all right, that means we're going to have 40,000 shares that we're dealing with. Okay, now look, remember our denominator is weighted average shares outstanding. So in reality, this would also be times 12 twelfths. Okay, so once again, I'm just kind of emphasizing that because when the dates change, this will factor in. We'll look at that in a second. All right, so typically what I do then is I say, all right, what is my per share effect? Okay, so a per share effect, uh, so it's 28,000 over 40,000 shares. All right, so that equals 70 cents. Okay, and you compare this number to basic. So this number is less than basic, so it's diluted. OK, so you have to get to this point to know whether it is diluted or not. We'll see an example, I think, in the preferred stock I do one where this number ends up being more. Uh, and you'll see that it that way it will have a it's not diluted. All right. So we'll get to that. in a minute. So if this number is less, it has a dilutive effect. Right. So how we go about doing this when we calculate diluted earnings per share, we simply take basic. That's our starting point. So we have eighty three thousand. Over a hundred. And we're going to add into that our per share effect of the bonds. OK, and that works out to be 81 cents per share. All right. So that's clearly less than basic. And that would be our answer for diluted earnings per share if this was our only diluted security. All right. So let's look at it. Let's switch gears here a little bit and go over here and say, what if these bonds had been issued on August 30th of current year? OK, so. What we're saying is they weren't outstanding all year. So if you go back, let me flip back over here real quick. What I'm talking about is this sentence right here or this or when they were issued, if after the beginning of the period. So that's what we're dealing with now. All right. So if we flip over here, if they had been issued on August 30th, so we're still going to have a numerator and denominator effect. All right. So I'm still doing numerator and denominator. All right. So numerator will now be, it'll still be 500,000 times 8%. All right, times one minus the tax rate. But now we are multiplying it times four twelfths. In the previous example, we multiplied it times 12 twelfths because it was outstanding the whole year. But now it, the interest has only been accruing for four months, September, October, November, and December. So we only have four months of interest. Okay, so that means our numerator effect is 9,333. Our denominator effect is still 40,000 shares. That's how many shares would be we're dealing with. But remember, we're going to weight those by the fraction of the year they're outstanding, which is four twelfths. OK, so that gives me 13, 333. Three. All right. So take the per share on that. And we have the nine, three, three, three over the 13, three, three, three. 
Uh, it still equals 70 cents, that's fine. And that's still less than 83, so it is dilutive. All right, and then we just add that in to get our earnings per share number. So diluted earnings per share. We still start with basic, 83,000 over 100,000. And we just add in our per share effect, our numerator and our denominator effects. And it works out to be 81 cents. So it didn't change the answer, but you know it potentially could when you're dealing with different numbers. So the main thing to keep in mind here is pay attention. So I, I do this just to really re emphasize, you know, to pay attention to your dates, right? So you can go, you go back to the beginning of the year if they were outstanding all year, all right? If not, you can only go back to that point in time where they were issued, all right? So remember, diluted earnings per share. No, we're not. None of this happened. We didn't convert these bonds. We're saying what would the effect be on earnings per share if everything was converted or exercised. So remember, that's the whole point of diluted earnings per share. So I know this video is getting a little bit long, so I'm going to cut it off here. Uh, but hopefully this helps you understand convertible bonds and hopefully it emphasizes the point to make sure you're always paying attention to these dates. Okay, hopefully you like that. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel. It does help me out. Uh, and I'll be tuning in with you guys next time when we uh, switch gears and talk about convertible preferred stock and how that affects diluted earnings per share. See you next time.